Good morning. It's good to be at the Grove, amen? And if you're a Wildcat fan, it's good to be 6-0. and That's what I'm talking about. Now, for those of you who are Bengals fans, I'm sorry. I am a Green Bay Packers fan, and so uh, today, uh, I'm sorry for you. The rest of the time, I'm all for you, but today, not today. I want to thank you here at the Grove. I want to thank Brother Bill for the... Uh, privilege of being able to come and uh, share with you today and to be able to speak God's word. Also, it's an opportunity for me to say thank you to the Grove uh, because of your ongoing support of the NKBA and most recently in our efforts in Louisiana after the recent uh, hurricane, uh, we were able to deliver 42 generators to uh, uh, Louisiana, to the New Orleans area, uh, to families and churches there who needed that, for fans, for homes, churches that uh, electricity and everything was knocked out in and so on, you have made an immeasurable difference. And $10,000 worth of gift cards were distributed to people on the ground who were most in need right then. So thank you. Thank you for helping make that possible. And that's what happens. In 73 churches in the NKBA, uh, we're better together. And what we can do together is just amazing. So thank you for being a major, major part of that. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And do pray for Brother Bill as he's running tomorrow. My best friend, Fred Jackson, uh, age 69, is running in his eighth Boston Marathon. Uh, and just after getting over COVID. So uh, prayers to all of those who are participating, uh, particularly, but particularly Brother Bill. And uh, I would appreciate you remember my friend Fred Jackson as well in your prayers. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Genesis. That should be easy to find in your app uh, and in your physical copy if you have one. Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. And today, I, I want to talk to you about a man named Joseph, and he had an amazing resume uh, of how God formed and shaped his life. You know, this is my 45th year in ministry, and so I have served in churches, I've served in higher education as a professor and as a dean, and I've served in a lot of different roles, and I've, I've gone through a lot of resumes over the course of that time. I've seen a lot of resumes and hiring folks and, and so on. And I'm always fascinated when I come across an example of one that's maybe a little on the extreme side, you know, where somebody has kind of gone over the top on the resume. Well, I want you to look at this one because uh, this is one that I, I've held on to because, well, it's just priceless in and of itself. Uh, in one column, uh, this, here we go. Uh, in one column here, uh, Rusty Rose uh, tells us that he claims to be the best in the world at reading comprehension, database administration, web graphics and design, social media, and chivalry. How many of you ever seen chivalry on a resume? Yeah, now obviously Rusty was kind of an over-the-top kind of guy, and he made that uh, represented on his resume as well. But what if you came across a resume that had these uh, 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 credentials? Uh, graduated from Harvard with an MBA, uh, quickly climbed the ranks of McKinsey Consulting, the top consulting company in America, recruited by a major energy company and became a CEO within six years, and transformed that energy company into the largest wholesaler of gas and electricity with $27 billion traded in a single quarter. Now, would you not want to hire that guy or gal? Yeah. Who wouldn't want to hire that person? But what if I told you that that was the resume of a guy by the name of Jeff Skilling. Now, you have to go back a little bit in history. About 20 years ago, uh, there was a scandal that cost 20,000 people their jobs at a company called Enron. Jeff Skilling was the man that caused that collapse to happen. And not only 20,000 people at Enron lose their jobs, but 85,000 more people at the accounting firm Arthur Anderson lost that job. Now, does that change the way you look at that resume? 
Yeah, just a little bit. Of course it does. We, we spend a lot of our lives focused on resume virtues. We do that many times at the price, the cost of ignoring some more important virtues, the virtues that I think that really, really matter in our lives. New York Times journalist David Brooks calls them eulogy virtues. I like that. I like that. Resume virtues are the ones of the skills that you bring to the marketplace on your resume, but eulogy virtues are the ones that are talked about when your life is celebrated, maybe at an end of life celebration. Were you kind, courageous, honest, faithful, loving, you know, those kinds of things. And, and most of us have a sense that eulogy virtues are more important than resume virtues, but what do we spend the most time on in our lives building? I think that we are always trying to develop for success, for our career, what, what, what puts us in the best light in front of other people, what our persona is on social media, on Facebook and Instagram and all of the other platforms and, and so on. And we spend too little time on the virtues, the qualities that build character, the real you, the real me that most people don't see, those eulogy virtues. Well, today we're going to look at a man named Joseph who endured a lot of very specific events that we're not likely to encounter in certainly the same fashion as he did, but I want us today to look at his life and see how Joseph remained faithful to God even when he experienced the greatest moments of personal stress. Now, Joseph's book, his, his story is found in the book of Genesis, uh, and Joseph embodied a very important virtue. Uh, I believe it was a eulogy virtue. It's one that I would call integrity. Integrity. Integrity is that which keeps us from that dangerous drift of getting away from our mission, our focus, the center of who we are, particularly those of us who, who claim Christ as our Savior, that he is our center. Now, Joseph lived with tremendous integrity, even though he had a lot of intense pressure to compromise his faith. When you look back at his story, and you can flip back to chapter 37, Joseph was just a teenager. He was the 11th of 12 sons and a clear favorite of his aging father, Jacob. In fact, his father so preferred him above all of his 11 brothers that he gave to him a special colorful robe. You know, an amazing technicolor dream coat. Maybe it looks something like this. Who knew Joseph looked like Donny Osmond? But every time, can you imagine, every time that his brothers looked at him, they were reminded of their father's preference for their younger brother. Now, Jacob could have used a parenting class or two, maybe even a book on common sense, I don't know, but the robe that he gave Joseph went over like a lead balloon in that family, and you can't imagine how much it caused those brothers to hate Joseph. Until one day, they just reached their breaking point. As they were out in, in their fields tending their flocks, they saw Joseph, and he was just flaunting that, that beautiful coat, and something just snapped inside all of them. And Joseph, in chapter 37, verse 23, tells that Joseph is betrayed by his brothers. He's literally stripped of everything, thrown in a hole, and eventually sold as a slave in Egypt. And so this is where we pick up the story today, in Genesis chapter 39, because the bottom is literally dropped out of Joseph's life. He has no position, no privilege, and no more dream coat. So, chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. An Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. Now, Joseph was sold to this man named Potiphar. He was a big deal, captain of Pharaoh's guard, wealthy, influential, military leader. So Joseph started probably as low as you could on the scale in, in, in Potiphar's house. He was the least important person, but things began to change quickly. And we see that following in verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him, underline that, 
underline that because we're going to hit that again. The Lord was with him. And that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household. And he entrusted his care to his care everything that he owned. Now Potiphar saw that there was an unusual amount of blessing in everything that Joseph does. And so he promotes him up the chain of command until Joseph is literally in charge of everything that Potiphar owns. So yes, things are looking up for Joseph. But as you can imagine, stories have their plot twists. And yes, we have another one here. Let's look down at verse 6. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Now, how many times have you found yourself looking at something that could potentially distract you? Again, as you're driving along the highway, something that distracts you, something that catches your eye. Remember King David as he was looking out and he saw Bathsheba bathing. And the Bible says that when he looked at her, that he looked, and he uses the perfect tense, which means he looked, he looked, and he kept looking. And ultimately that gaze caused King David to murder, lie, and lose the lives of loved ones around him. Keep in mind, there's a power dynamic here at play with Potiphar's wife. Joseph was a slave. She was his master. So Joseph's very life was on the line as she made this advance. My friend John Weiss is a pastor at South and Christian Church in Lexington, and he said this once, and I want you to read this with me, and I want you to read it aloud. This is a group participation. Everybody read along, okay? So read this with me. Read this quote. It is so powerful. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing you. Come on. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin keeps you longer than you want to stay. And sin costs you more than you want to pay. Now when you consider that, it makes Joseph's response really even more significant. As you look at Joseph's response in verse 8. But he refused, Potiphar's wife, he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything that he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Now, Joseph calls the situation exactly what it is. It's a betrayal of her husband. And then he says the main reason that he won't sleep with her is because of his relationship with God. That is what grounds him, which holds him. But if you watch, and, and in verse 10, this isn't a one-time deal. Although, he spoke, although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. He kept on hitting on Joseph, and he kept turning her down. Verse 11, uh, his, his Potiphar's wife would not relent, and so one day she gives everybody in the house the day off except Joseph, and when he enters the house, she grabs his clothing and makes an advance at him again. This time Joseph makes a break for it, but she holds on to his robe, and Joseph ends up running out of the palace buck naked. Well, just about the time in the story that you think that Joseph has escaped her trap, look with me at verse 13. But when she saw he had left his garment with her and had run outside, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, my husband brought a Hebrew man to make fools of us. He came to me so that he could sleep with me, and I screamed as loud as I could. And when he heard me screaming for help, he left his garment beside me and ran outside. So just about the time you think Joseph's gotten out of this trap, Mrs. Potiphar concocts a story that paints Joseph as the evil-intentioned aggressor in the story. And as you can imagine, when Mr. Potiphar hears about this, he's none too pleased. Verse 19, when his master heard the story, his wife told him, 
These are the things your slave did to me. He was furious and had him thrown into prison. Now, you can imagine here that he wasn't thrown into a white-collar resort prison. Uh, Potiphar's wife made a big miscalculation here because she misjudged Joseph's integrity, and he was willing to even go to jail because he was not willing to be unfaithful to his God nor to the one whom he served. She thought that her power and and basic human desire would be enough to find a chink in Joseph's armor, but instead his integrity holds up against all of her advances and she is left with nothing but his clothes and crying wolf. And though Joseph did nothing wrong in this instant, Joseph finds himself without a coat, without any status, And once again, Joseph's in a hole again. Only this time it's prison. And it seems like Joseph is actually forgotten. So, what can we take from this part of the story with Joseph that can help us and guide us in our lives to live the kinds of lives that Jesus wants us to live? Well, before, let me remind you, everybody I think agrees that there are two things that are sure in life that you can bank on. What are they? Death and taxes. That's right. I would add a third. We can also bank on our integrity being put to the test and that our enemy, Satan, wants to do everything that he can to defeat us. We live in a world that is so messed up and we are going to face challenges, temptations, invitations to compromise our integrity. So here's the first step. Here's the first thing that we want to take away from Joseph's life and this part of the story. Number one, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. We should expect it. We should be ready for it, even anticipate it. Because these kinds of situations are going to come at you in life. There are going to be temptations and challenges uh, that that are going to come to you in the workplace, uh, in your relationships in life. And sometimes we're going to fail. Sometimes we're going to fall. And that's when we need Jesus. And we need His grace. And we find that grace through genuine repentance on our hearts. That means we have to turn away from that sin, to turn and run the other way from it, just like Joseph did. There is hope in Jesus, no matter what you may have done. It doesn't mean that we we escape the scars or the consequences of our decisions. My dad was a simple old country farmer, and he always told me, he said, son, you can't unscramble an egg. Guess that's true. But hear me on this. Don't be surprised when you face situations that challenge you to compromise your integrity. Be ready. Anticipate it. Our enemy wants to take you down and wants to neutralize and eliminate your witness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who lost his life when he stood firm against Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, and he refused to compromise in the face of massive pressure. And here's how he describes temptations that attack our integrity. I want to read directly from Bonhoeffer's book, Temptation. And he writes, In our members there is a slumbering inclination towards desire which is both sudden and and fierce. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. And all at once a secret, smoldering fire is kindled, and the flesh burns and is in flames. How's that for a vivid picture of temptation? And he goes on, it makes no difference whether it is sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame and power or greed for money. At this moment, God is quite unreal to us. He loses all reality. 
Satan does not fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. Satan does not fill us with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God. The hard truth is that we are in a very real battle. The struggle is real. There is a war going on between good and evil. There is a war that is going on between all that is fair and just and right against all that is wrong and biased and and corrupt. And our mission as followers of Jesus is to be the light, to help people see the light that is in Christ and Christ alone, to be his followers, to seek and to save that which is lost, to make disciples who make disciples. But our enemy, this is what he wants. He wants us to forget our mission. He wants us to forget our God. And he wants us to give in. So don't be surprised when he comes after you. He wants nothing more than to compromise your integrity, to make a mockery of what God wants to do in you and through you to bring his love to a lost and hurting world. Our enemy wants to bury you in sin and guilt and regret, and shame. Now that may not seem particularly hopeful, but hear me, our enemies on the offensive, wanting nothing more than for us to just compromise, just to give in a little, just to make this little exception here or there. But don't be surprised. And here's the second principle I want you to take away from Joseph's story here. It's this, dwell in God. Now, one of Jesus' closest followers, John, wrote to a group of Christ followers a lot like us. And the enemy was coming at them through other teachers who were trying to convince them of, to compromise and to, to give in and ideas that were counter to Jesus' teaching. And, and John says this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. I memorized this as a kid. It was greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. Knowing that scripture and learning that reminds me that I belong to Jesus. And I'm here today to remind you that you belong to Jesus. That his spirit lives inside you. He lives inside me. And he is far greater than any temptation that we may have faced are facing or will face in the future. Now there's that phrase that I ask you to underline that we see over and over in Joseph's story. It's in verse 2, verse 3, verse 21, and verse 23. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. Four times this phrase is repeated in this part of the story because Joseph lived in a constant awareness of God's presence. He knew that his decision in the moment of crisis was tied to his relationship with God. He knew that there was someone who was by his side who was far greater than whatever temptation that he may have been facing. Dave Ferguson, another pastor who wrote the blessed book that I hope that you're all going to be reading and I know that uh, there's going to be a series that you're uh, uh, using, uh, the blessed series coming up. Uh, Dave said once... To have integrity means we do not change face when we change company. To have integrity means we do not change face when we change company. That we are who we are no matter where we are. And this happens and this is possible when we live in a constant awareness of the one who is with us. Letting his character be our character and giving us what we we need so that we can be who we can never be on our own without him. This brings me to the last principle we can take away from Joseph's story, and that is to consistently live with integrity, to avoid temptation. We have to decide in advance that we will do the next right thing. Joseph had already decided to do right by Potiphar and by God, his Inspired choice beforehand to live a life of integrity gave him the strength to 
resist persuasion and temptation. There's a phrase that comes from the 12 step and recovery movement. It says, when you don't know what to do, do the next right thing. When you don't know what to do, do the next right thing. You see, often when we're at a crossroads in the moment of decision, considering a compromise, we, we, we convince ourselves, oh, this isn't, this isn't going to be a big deal. It's just nobody will know. One little detour. But remember what Bonhoeffer said. We don't suddenly hate God. We just momentarily forget about God. Andy Stanley says that the decisions you make today determine the stories you tell tomorrow. I love that. I quote it often. And when we're wrestling with what to do in our lives, just do the next right thing. Remember that the decisions you make today will determine the kind of story you are going to tell tomorrow. The Apostle Paul shares these assuring words in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. When you are tempted, he, God, will show you a way out so that you can endure. Now, friends, that's a promise that you can bank on. That God is going to provide a way out. For Joseph, being faithful became a habit. It, it became an attitude. It was a habitude. It was a way of living for him. It was about doing the next right thing over and over and over again. One choice at a time, one decision at a time, one day at a time. And as great as Joseph's example is of integrity for us, it's important that we don't walk out of here thinking, man, I just need to work harder at being good. Or even worse, I have messed up so big. It's just too late for me. Now, while we would all love to be Joseph every moment and every moment of temptation, we're not. And the truth is, just as important as our eulogy virtues are, even they are not the source of our hope. Our hope is in Jesus. And as a follower of Jesus, I stand before you today as a person who is deeply flawed by sin, who is seeking to live in repentance daily, trying to do the next right thing. And I'm constantly asking Jesus to help me pick up the pieces of my brokenness. And when we put our faith in him and the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross, he offers us his spirit who comes inside of us and gives us grace and peace and forgiveness and hope and the power to do the next right thing. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. See, when God looks at us, he doesn't see all of our sins. He sees us clothed in Jesus. So I don't want you to leave here today discouraged or weighed down by guilt or shame. Instead, know that today that Jesus offers you new spiritual clothes. Clothes that will completely and perfectly cover all of your sins. Clothes that will secure your place as a child of God. Clothes that can never be stripped away, taken away, removed, no matter what happens. This is the good news of grace. And this is what Jesus offers every one of us who repents and puts our faith and our trust in him. I want to invite our musicians, our praise team to, to come. Because today as we close this service, I want to make a very direct invitation to you, and I want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus if you've never said yes to him before. Yes to Jesus to receive his grace. And if you think you have gone too far away from that grace and that you're a lost cause, hear me. You're wrong. Today, you can repent. That means to turn and run away from that sin. Turn away from that sin and run to the open arms of Jesus. 
Let his grace completely cover your past, your present, and guide your future. Let him put new and eternal spiritual clothes on you. And remember that Jesus died for you because he loves you. And there's nothing you can do to change that. Don't miss this opportunity today. If you've never walked with Jesus before, that today you begin walking with him for the first time. Or maybe you've been walking with him, but maybe you've been distracted away from your mission, away from a calling that God has on your life. And maybe today you just need to take a step back closer to him. I want you to hear, he's calling out your name. He's calling out your name. Jody, Lori, Jim, Bill, Ann, David, Amy. He is calling your name. Won't you respond to him today? I invite you to stand as we sing the closing song of invitation. I'll be here. I'd love to pray with you today. If God is speaking and you need to take a step, I invite you to come.